Connection podcast, the show that provides commentary and encouragement as you walk through your Bible reading plan. My name is John Steinke, and today we're talking about the book of Romans. As usual, we have guests on the podcast that have taken time to study and answer our questions. Um, this week, we're going to have Brandon Stukesbury walking us through Romans. What's up? And uh, we have a guest, Mark Shaddix, who's going to be with us for the next couple episodes. Hey, happy to be here. How are you guys doing this morning? Doing great. I think this is our first early morning recording of a podcast. And I say early morning, but we did spend a good like 30 minutes talking about it before we got started. So now it's like mid-morning. Oh, yeah. Um, as we get started, um, you know, before we really follow Paul's argument through Romans, um, how does he kind of set up the letter for us to read? His introductions, you know, are pretty consistent throughout the New Testament. What is this introduction doing for us? Yeah, so, so an important thing to understand specifically with the book of Romans and how he introduces it. He, he starts it off, off um, from, from, from verse 1, and it's a, it, it is literally a logical argument from, from chapter 1, verse 1, all the way through 16. And the, with, with Romans, one of the most important things about under about this letter and understanding what Paul is saying about it is is following this logical order. Um, this 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 letter is written as what's called a diatribe. So what Paul is doing, he's 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 giving, he's he's giving, he's he's talking, 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 he's teaching, 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 and then he'll make he'll make a statement, and then after the statement, he'll Ask a question, and then in that question, there is a there is a hypothetical response, right? He's 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 um, so what what we have to what we need to do is is as we're following through his his argument, if we're not asking the questions that he's giving us, we're not understanding the flow of what he's saying. So, um, and then and then two. He he begins he begins the letter by saying that that this is Paul, although Paul, um, we we in chapter sixteen he has uh, someone writing this. He's not actually the person writing it down, but he's dictating this um, to someone. But Paul is saying that he is a servant of Christ Jesus, that he's called to be an apostle. Now we know he wasn't part of the original apostles, um, but he was he was. He experienced the risen Christ. Um, he is set apart for the gospel of God. Um, now, this is this is a test case for what what I, I want to present in the book of Rome or in the letter of Romans is when you come to, for instance, we we have all kinds of thoughts that pop through our head when we when we come to gospel, right? You know, is this Wait a minute. Is the is the gospel? Is this like a like the gospel of Mark, or is this the gospel of Luke, or or, or is this the the good news? Well, what is this good news? You know, uh, there's all kinds of questions. There's all kinds of things we may be thinking when we see that word gospel. But here, this is this is what I want. This is a test case for understanding Paul. Um, when we read gospel here. Does our understanding of what Paul is saying by gospel correspond to what he says in verse 2? The gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now, wait a minute. That's the Old Testament. We've talked about, we've, been, we've, we've spent months and months and months talking about the Old Testament. And, you know, you notice here he doesn't give you an exact citation of a certain verse which he does quite often in the book of Romans but he's he is appealing to the corpus you know from Genesis to Malachi and beginning in Genesis 3:15 that there is the promise of the seed of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent um and we'll see he uses that language later on um but this gospel is is thoroughly talked about in the Old Testament, and and then he goes on concerning his son, whom is descended from David. Now wait a minute, what does it matter that he's descended from David? 
these are the questions that you need to ask as you're if you don't if you don't think through what he's saying here, you may lose what he's trying to say. So he's descended from David according to the flesh. Why would he add that? You know, so Paul Paul he's he's this 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 snowball <laughs> begins rolling down the hill, right? Mm-hmm. And it starts off slowly and then it's it it it's 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 gaining speed and it's gaining size very quickly, um, according to the flesh, and was declared to be son of God, in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead. So the resurrection here is is absolutely key for understanding the book of Romans. Resurrection, you can't. He, he is dealing with the resurrection over and over and over again. And what he's saying here is that Jesus is declared to be the Son of God in power by the resurrection. And so understanding that, that, that statement is setting, is setting the stage for the rest of this letter. So, um, and then um, move, moving on, in, in this introduction here, um, and for sake of time here, I've told you not to skip over stuff, but I'm going to skip a few things here. But if you see here, um, well, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and in, in, in now in, in verse 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. Now this is a bookend because in chapter sixteen, verse twenty-six, if you if you just quickly look there, he ends he ends the book of Romans, and I think this is this is a key for what is what is what is the the book of Romans? It's 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 too simple. It's too simplistic to say that there's one point that Paul's trying to say in the book of Romans, but if if we see how he begins and ends the book of Romans and it's the same statement. Pretty good, pretty good, um, pretty good thought that this is at least a major theme in the book of Romans. So if you look at um, chapter 16, uh, verse 26, but now it's been declared. Well, uh, let's just let's look at the doxology from 25 and we're, we're beginning the Rome, the book of Romans from the very end. So, um, now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel, which is a, he, he uses that statement quite often in Romans, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed through the prophetic writings, has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God, and here it is, to bring about the obedience of faith. That's exactly the same phrase he uses in chapter one, um, in chapter one, verse five. Look at it again. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among all the nations. So not just Jewish people, not just God's covenant people in the Old Testament, but now Jews, Gentiles, all all peoples are now under. Or Christ has come for all peoples um, to to bring them in, so that the, the the language of John that they would be one flock with one shepherd. So um, I think that is absolutely key for understanding. Paul Paul gives us that 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 at the beginning of Romans to help us to set the stage for what for everything he's going to say in the next sixteen chapters. So. So unlike some of the books we've seen in the Old Testament, like Psalms, where we could be easily encouraged to look at each individual psalm as like a completed section, we need to be approaching Romans, one thing bleeding into the very next and making sure we're following his argument step by step. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying that there may not be benefit for looking at um, looking at chapter 5 um, and sections in chapter 5 for understanding. Just make sure that when that. we're looking at chapter 5 for that benefit, we're remembering to look back yes. at chapter 4 and follow yes. the chain yes. of the argument. Yeah, and what and what, fall, and what follows from there, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, as we do start to open up into the book of Romans and get into some of those first arguments, um, we see that God's saving righteousness is obtained by faith 
what is righteousness? If, if this is something that we need to follow through throughout the argument, what is that righteousness that we're going to be looking at? Yeah, so this is, this is a, a, a it, it sounds quite easy to understand, and, and I, I will just ask the listener, um, you hear the word righteousness, but ask yourself the question, what is it? I mean, think through that. And you might think, well, it's, you know, it's righteousness. And you're like, well, don't give, don't, don't answer the, don't answer the question with, with, don't give a definition to what the question with the same, you know, with the same thing. And in, in Romans, well, in our, our English text, it's, it, it gets quite complicated. Our, 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 I'm sorry. Our English texts are helping us here understand. Um, they're 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 helping us um, understand what is a little bit more complicated in the original, because righteousness, the root of the word righteousness, the de, dikao in in Greek, is is where we get the word covenant, um, and so. Um, so, and what makes it even more complicated is, so you see righteousness, and then you see just or justification. That's the same word, right? It's just, and I, in, in years past, I've, I've tried to help people see that, that justification, the reason that the wording is, is used that way is because if you didn't say, justification or someone is now just if we didn't change that language it would literally say you've been righteousified um so the the english is trying to help us here understand what in the original is a little bit more complicated to understand but the root of the word righteous um is covenant and so you may think covenant what where what covenant are you talking about well as we've worked our way through the Old Testament, and we've we've seen um, many many covenants in the Old Testament. Um, we saw a covenant in the Garden um, with at with Adam. We're going to see that again in chapter five. Um, we we saw a covenant with Noah. We saw a covenant with Abraham. Saw a covenant with um, uh, Moses. Um, covenant with David, um, and then the New Covenant. But I think here he's referencing. The covenant with Abraham, and now all the covenant, the covenants are stair steps that, that that are stepping up and culminating in the new covenant. But I think he's he's referencing um, um, the, the the covenant with Abraham because in the covenant with Abraham, he's specifically talking about bringing about a people, right? That in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. In you, you will be the father of many nations. And that's where um, the book of Romans is, is, is playing out because in Abraham, there was a son of the son of the covenant and then son not of the covenant, right? So in, from the same man, there are two sons, right? And that's, that's the flow of Paul's argument. But what he's saying here is he's, he's speaking, he's speaking because um, to a, I think a Jewish mind, they would be thinking, well, through through Torah, through the law, is how is where righteousness comes. But Paul is doing something radical here, because he's saying what he what he's saying here is that righteousness has been covenant faithfulness. I think it's I think it's it, it would help. If um, if you just make a note and just every time you see righteousness, you just make a note and say covenant faithfulness, covenant faithfulness, um, and and Abraham because and also in in the covenant with Abraham, God said you know he made Abraham he he took the, took the animals cut them in half walked, um, God Himself walked through, um, made this covenant with Abraham that if that if this doesn't happen there is to be a death. That, that happens, and, and making a long story short, Jesus does that. Jesus takes that death of that covenant, right? So in order that the covenant not, might not be broken. Um, but, but, but moving on here, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, 
in verse 16. Um, and uh, I would highly encourage you to suspend presuppositions of what you think this might mean, right? And just follow what Paul has said because the gospel here, a lot of times in thinking about the gospel, we think, oh, well, the gospel is how, how unbelievers get saved. Well, that's not what he's saying here because look at, look at, he's not saying I'm bringing, I'm going to bring you the gospel so that you can get saved. If you have that understanding, you will misread what he's saying because look in the section before this, he's saying that I'm coming to you so that I can be encouraged by your faith and you can be encouraged by mine. These people are in the covenant. They are Christians, right? But he's saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So Jews and Gentiles, right? This gospel that's been promised before, right? Is the power of God, right? For salvation. For in it, now this is this is what we need to see here. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, literally apocalypsis, uh, that has been uh, uh, apocalypse is where we get this word. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, from beginning to end. And he could be in reference here, it began with the Jews and it's continuing on with the Gentiles. As it is written, the, just, the righteous shall live by faith. What he's saying here is he this is this is a critique for a Jewish a Jewish exclusivism, right? That righteousness can only be can only flow from the law. Paul is saying here, no, no, righteousness now has been revealed from the gospel. So we see here that Paul is is setting this up for this this congregation at, at, at least. Um that, that the righteousness of God is coming from the gospel, right? And then he goes on in, in at the, uh, the end of chapter 1 to show that um, the, the universal universal condemnation, right? He, he's, he, he speaks about that, God, that God's attributes are revealed. People, people don't have to have the law to know that God exists, that God is sovereign, and that God judges unrighteousness, un covenant breaking. So you need to, I would highly encourage you to, as you're going through Romans, especially in the first third of the book of Romans, anywhere where it says righteousness, see the contrast with righteousness and unrighteousness because he's he's doing he's playing on this. And sometimes there's some chiasms in this um, that he's that he's doing. Um uh, well, and, and then also just and justification um, and, and things like that. But his his eternal power and divine nature in verse 20 have been clearly perceived. So there's a play here. Okay, God's righteousness is revealed. Okay, it's, it's now being, now you can see it because of the gospel in verse 16. But he's saying, but in the past, it's from creation. It's been clearly you've been able to see this from so you see here's the, there's a contrast. Um, this has clearly been perceived through what has been made. So everyone is without excuse. Everyone everyone is um, is is guilty before God, right? And then and then flowing from that that guiltiness, we see if you continue on in that guiltiness, he ends chapter one th throughout chapter one. What how? You know, you know, suppressing the truth in unrighteousness, knowing that there's a God, and that He judges unrighteousness, un unfaithfulness. When you do that, you continue. You continue on in grotesque sin, and that's where he um, um, he he's going with with all of the things that he gets that he gets to. Um, verse twenty six. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Um, um, in uh, verse 27, receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Um, the next verse, God gave them up to a debased mind to do whatever and not um, what not ought not to be done. 
Um, they were filled with unrighteousness. Um, verse 32, they knew God's righteous decree and that those who practice such things will die. Um, they not only um, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So he's saying the Gentiles, right, they are clearly, there, there's, there's condemnation that's coming to the Gentiles. But then in chapter 2, he does um, something quite interesting because a lot of times chapter 2, chapter 2, we, we skip over this a lot um, because we think we understand what Paul is saying. Right. And um, in, in chapter 2, he, he pivots and he's saying, yes, there's, there is this, just, this, this, this condemnation that's coming upon all men, but God's judgment isn't just for condemnation. God's judgment, we have saw in the Old Testament, a lot of times is vindication Right. David is praying in the Psalms to be vindicated because he knows that he's righteous, right, and he's being accused of false of, of wrongdoing, right. And he's praying to the Lord, "Vindicate me, O God, according to my righteousness." Uh, and I think that Paul Paul is is alluding to this um, in in chapter two. So so in in dealing with Jews and Gentiles, um, um, at, in verse six. And he will. And we we skip over this a lot because it makes us uncomfortable. Um, but in in two six, and he will render each one according to his works. Wait a minute, that sounds that 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 that, that makes us uncomfortable. Um, those those who practice and um, well doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. He will give eternal life. But those who are self seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. Um, that, Will be tribulation and distress for every every human being who does evil to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So this is not just the Jews; it's also the Greeks. But the glory, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So condemnation is to both Jews and Greek, and 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 um, um, vindication is to Jews and Greeks. Verse twelve: For all who have sinned under the law will also perish without the law. That's Gentiles. Those who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. That's Jews. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. So you see here at verse 13, this is where it's important to see righteous and justified. It's the same word. Um, but we see here that there is a future aspect to justification. And a lot of times when we think about justification, we just think, oh, when I, I was justified when I got saved. That's a that's an overly simplistic view of this. We should see justification as there is an aspect in which in time, when we are when we are in Christ, right, when we put our faith in him, we are baptized into the triune name, we are part of the church, we are justified. We are, you know, and what 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 this is saying is is that this righteous requirement of the law now is credited to us, right? Because we are now in Christ. What Christ's life and death are given to us. Our sins were put on Christ. Christ's life and and his his life now is given to us because we are united to him. Right? That happens in time. But the thing about it is, there is a future aspect to justification that will be in accordance with the entire life lived, and that may that may be complicated. But I want to just quickly, we'll get to this later. Hopefully, we'll get to this. But in Romans eight, Paul does the same thing. In we we think about when were we adopted? When did when do we become sons of God? Right. Well, in Romans eight. In Romans 8, 15, he says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. You have received the spirit of adoption. That's past tense. But if you move on a couple of verses down in 23, he's, he's, he's talking about new creation here. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we await eagerly the adoption as sons, 
There's a, there's an aspect of adoption that is future. It's the same way with justification. Theologians call this the already and not yet, right? So we 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 have been adopted as sons, but yet there is a there is an aspect of adoption that we eagerly await in the new creation, in which we ultimately completely um, um, adoption we we have been adopted. So that's a um. That was a lot. It was. And, um, you know, we, we emphasized at the beginning how important it is that we take each section and we and we pay attention to what comes before and after and follow this chain of argument. Uh, but in the interest of time, we are going to need to start jumping around a little bit. Um, looking at the following chapters, Paul starts to reference Abraham and Adam. So what do Abraham and Adam have to do with this obedience of faith or finding life in Christ? Yeah, so so with Abraham, if you if you turn to chapter four, Paul is is dealing. He the the biggest thing is understanding that that Jew and whether Jew or Gentile, both are equally condemned. Both are equally can equally equally have access to the grace of God, um, and and in specifically covenant membership, local church. Each person, each person comes to the Lord's table, right? And one, there's not two tables. What the the biggest thing is, there's one table, and we we we've kind of lost lost perspective in that, and in 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 understanding that. So so with with Abraham, what Paul is doing in chapter four is showing that Abraham was justified. Was counted righteous. Was was counted as obedient before the law was given, and even before the sign of circumcision. Right? He believed God, and if you and and, and you need to feel the weight. You need to feel the weight, and, and I, I would highly encourage you just work through, um, work through chapter four, um, and just feel the weight of of put yourself in Abraham's situation. Where he was at, the age that he was that he was, he was given this promise. This time goes by. Um, it seems as though God's promise has failed. You, you, you know, and your wife is is aged. The the you you are you are as good as dead, right? But yet believing that God, that Yahweh will will make good on His promise. Um, um, feeling that and, and acting in a, in a way that corresponds to your faith. Um, um, but that, that this, this blessing that is coming upon the world, it came, it, it came to Abraham before he was circumcised. So before he could be considered as Jewish, right? In a, in a, that's a, an anachronistic way of looking at it. But the Jews couldn't say, "Oh, well, you know, it was circumcision." No, it was faith. Um, so, so in in Abraham, we can see that the gospel is for the whole world. And then in chapter five, when he's dealing with 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 Adam, and chapter five can be quite um, can be quite complicated, especially in chapter five verses twelve through twenty one. Because he's bouncing back and forth, he's talking about um, sin and death, and how sin came into the world, and how or how uh, death came into the world, and how sin spread, and and all of these things. But what we what what we need to to to, and I hate to do this because there's a, there's so much here, but understand in this that in Adam, Adam, Adam broke. The covenant, right? He 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 had life. He broke the covenant, as as the head broke the covenant. Death came in, right? And everyone, every every human being, coming from Adam, is fallen in Adam. Everyone dies because of Adam's sin. Everyone, whether you're Jew, Greek, Indian, you know, red, yellow, pur- purple, you know, you know, the red and the, yellow, black and white. Exactly, we're all guilty because of Adam's sin. 
right? We sin because of our father, Adam. We're guilty of that sin. But, and this is where Paul is picking up on the language of Isaiah 53, because there's the, the all and the many. You see here, and it, and it gets confusing because you will, you will see statements like uh, verse 16, and the free gift is not like the trespass and the result of the one man Adam's sin. Okay, Adam, that's, that's Adam. Right? But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will have um, will, will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift reign in life, that one man, Jesus Christ. Um, verse 18, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. And you may think, wait a minute, in Adam, everybody is condemned. But Paul here is saying, but in Christ, all men receive justification in life. Does that mean everyone is justified and, re- and re- receives life? This is where you, the understanding of the covenants is absolutely crucial. Because covenantally, everyone is in Adam. Everyone, you can't escape that covenant. If you were born, you were born in cov- in the Adamic covenant. But in Christ, everyone who is in Christ, all those men, and men here doesn't mean gender, it's, it's, it means men and women. Everyone who is in Christ receives justification in life. That's, that, that is how we must understand this. Um, what 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 he what he's saying here? So there's much more I want to say on this, but we don't have time. Well, thank you for your brevity. Um, but as we continue, uh, you you mentioned how appreciate that backhanded compliment there. Yeah, hey, I, you know, maybe it was just a, a front handed compliment. I don't know. As as we're talking through, um, you said that there is one table for both Jews and Gentiles. So where does this leave the nation of Israel that is striving to um, to enter into God's kingdom through works? rather than faith in Christ. I don't know that I would say um, maybe there were some Jews um, who just thought it was just works, but but um, it's pretty clear that in Second Temple Judaism they definitely saw um, they definitely saw um, the Mosaic Covenant as and there were many different there were many different groups of Jews we've talked about that. Um, but they definitely saw um, the the Mosaic Covenant as a gracious covenant. Um, but we, Paul does here talk about in in the Book of Romans, he talks about works works of the law, um, and the thinking that works of the law made people think that your covenant your covenant um, your covenant connection to God was because of the works that you were doing, right? And Paul is, is contrasting that, and he's saying, no, 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 no. No, our covenant, our covenant connection to God is through faith, right? And that faith leads to our obedience. And it's actually, the, the, the word faith and obedience is, in, in, in Greek, it's the same word. Um, we just, our English translations try to help us in that. But you see the absolute connection uh, you can't have one without the other, and James deals with that. Um, but um, in where this leaves um, the nation of Israel, so moving in, in, in chapter 7, Paul kind of pivots here, and he's talking about his brothers um, and how the law— um, we, we also, something else we, we have to understand, the law is good, right? The law, um, he even says, and you, you have to see anyone who thinks that the law— is a bad thing and that the law leads to um, sin, that's that's wrong. You can't understand it that way because look at what in verse 14, chapter 7, verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual. Um, we, we the, the, the law is a gracious covenant, right? But a misunderstanding of the works of law um, and, and 
that 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 can throw us that can throw us for a loop. Um, but but the nation of Israel, because they are um, predominantly seeing righteousness as apart from faith, um, and well, there's a reason why the the nation of Israel um, is is not the reason there, there's a reason why the nation of Israel predominantly rejected the Messiah. And this may sound anti-Semitic, but it's absolutely not because this is what Paul, Paul, this is, there's a greater, you know, God isn't doing one thing. He's never doing one thing for one purpose. There's always 10 gazillion reasons why he's doing any one thing. Right. And so he's, he's saying in, in Romans chapter nine, that the point of, because he even asked the question um, in chapter nine, verse six, but it, but it, uh, well, in um, um, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended of Israel belong to Israel, and that's that's one of the things you you, you need to understand that if you're not asking that question, you don't understand what Paul has just said in Romans eight. And we've skipped. There's so much in Romans eight that we just totally skipped over. But um, I'll I'll trust that Romans eight isn't as hard to understand as Romans nine. Um, but in Romans nine, Paul, what Paul is doing here is he's he's saying, so the Gentiles, the Gentiles have come into the covenant, right? But the Jews are predominantly rejecting Jesus as Messiah. They're rejecting God's new covenant. For them, that was even talked about in Jeremiah thirty-one, um, and so Paul is is giving us the reason why this is happening. He's saying that um, um, in, in, in verse ten, not only so when Rebecca had conceived children by the one man, our father Isaac, though they had not were not yet born and had done nothing good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue. Not because of works, but because of him who calls, alluding back to uh, Romans eight twenty nine, um, and 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 whatnot. Um, so he's he's showing that there is something greater that's happening here. Israel, Israel, ethnic Israel, predominantly is being is it, Paul is showing that God's election is showing that they're being cut off. They're, they're being cut off so that, and we see in, in chapter 10, the Gentiles can be grafted in. So he's, he's speaking, and, and it's, it's quite interesting, um, it's quite interesting that Paul is using the language of an olive tree here because the olive tree has been talked about over and over and over in the Old Testament. And so this, this olive tree of God's, pro, of, of, of God's promise and plan this has 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 come through the nation of Israel, and what Paul is saying is is that Israel has been cut off so that the Gentiles may be grafted in, and it wasn't that this 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 didn't this didn't happen because this didn't happen because oh well you know what God didn't take into consideration that they may that Jesus might be offensive to them and therefore they didn't they didn't no it was all part of God's plan. Even in the Gospels, Jesus is talking about the cornerstone that the the cornerstone that has caused the nation to stumble. Um, so, um, moving on, uh, I, I hate to really skip through, but well, election is not just some 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 will will say that election is just for Israel. That's absolutely false. You can't you can't say that because. In, in chapter 9, verse 11, he's, he's alluding to here Jeremiah. Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another, another um, for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make his power and uh, to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known um, his re- his his vessels um, of mercy has prepared beforehand for glory, even us 
whom he has called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. So calling here, election, predestination, happens not just for Israel, but for everyone. Everyone, right? You know, he he, he chooses some and passes over others, right? And we see that election here, God's, you know, bringing, bringing election, um, bringing the Gentiles into God's promise. He alludes to Hosea here, where he says, there's, I'm going to call a people who is not my people. I'll, I'm going to call them my people now. And then the the allusion from Isaiah, he's speaking to Israel. He's saying, don't think just because you're, you're physical descendants of Abraham, you're, you're sons of God. Because even, even in Israel, Isaiah is told there's a remnant that is going to be that is going to be saved. So, um, yeah. Well, um, I know that there's so much more that we want to go through in Romans, but as you get towards the end, we do see that Paul takes time, um, in light of everything that he's written, to to outline what Christian living should look like. So. In light of everything we've read in Romans, what should the Christian life look like as we close out the book? Yeah, so you see at the end of chapter 11, there's kind of a doxology in verse 1130, um, 1130, I believe it's um, 33 through 36. And then from that doxology, which which he's just said an ex- something extremely heavy about God's God's election and His sovereign, um, what what He's doing, that a partial hardening coming on Israel and um, consigning a, consigning what, all the what's a doxology again? Doxology, um, uh, praise. He's giving. He's he's praising the Lord because basically, this is this is he's he's come to the to the he he's come to the summit of his understanding and he's saying there's so much more. I'm going to lift up my hands. Praise you, Lord, um, for your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Your ways are higher than my ways. Um, you know, I've come to the end, right? Um, <clears throat> and, and in coming to the end, he's taking what he's learned from 1 through 11, and he's saying, Now I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, now present your bodies as a living, living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Um, this is your spiritual worship. And so from there, um, <clears throat> it is quite different. Um, the rest, the rest, the rest of the book of Romans until the final part, um, he's dealing with, um, within the church, um, within the church. And then also, um, covenant, covenant obedience. What does it look like in, in real life, in the world, how is it that, you know, before we went to the temple um, the, the, and the tabernacle before it, we presented offerings. Now, the temple is the temple's going to be gone in a couple of years, right? It's going to be completely destroyed, right? Now, the church is the new temple in that we present, we present our offerings as this new temple. It's interesting. Now it's presented outward. Right before it was presented inward, now it's presented outward, um, and we're ma- you know we're 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 showing our we're showing to the world right what covenant obedience looks like um, as the, this new temple, and that's what he's doing um, for um, from basically um, uh, twelve through fif- through fifteen, so get into a lot of that but um and if you do want to look more into it on your own um scott hood had a sermon on june uh 5th of 2022 that was talking about christian living here at the conclusion of romans and i highly recommend that you take the time to listen to it if you're looking for more to look into um but with all that said that does bring us to the end of this week's episode of the bible connection podcast thank you so much to everyone who took the time to listen this week we hope this podcast equips and encourages you as you read, and we're all excited to read the book of 1 Corinthians. In the meantime, leave a comment on YouTube if you have any questions, and we hope you have a blessed day.